health and safety school staff. My name is Arnel Catalan, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the CHIPS National Technical Committee. I'm also an architect from MVG Architects in Massachusetts, and I have worked with engineers, commissioning agents, and contractors on school projects for over 25 years. When I think of building science, I think of the occupants. As an architect, my role is not only to provide building systems that are energy efficient and healthy, but also to educate school occupants on building science and how it operates behind the school building. For example, we provide interactive TV monitors that displays the school building's daily energy and water consumption. We provide educational science about the school building's sustainable features, and we train school staffs to effectively operate the building systems. We hope that our speakers today will expand your understanding of the science behind and the green and healthy school, and that you join us for more School Building Science Fridays. We thank our sponsors for making this series possible. IN2 Architecture, Group 40 Engineering, Working Assessment, and Healthy Schools Network. Sponsorship opportunities are still available. And if you're interested, please contact us. And now I'll turn it over to Elizabeth Koshide, Managing Director at CHIPS, Elizabeth is a former certified energy manager who first learned the importance of building science for working with the green affordable housing. Elizabeth has brought that perspective to CHIPS and enjoys advocating for a solid understanding of the school building science for all involved. Thank you. Thank you, Arnell. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm going to actually go back up to the agenda briefly since I breezed through that slide earlier and make sure you know the format for today. Thank you to Arnell for the welcome and introductions. And I'm gonna give an overview of building science and how we're defining school building science. And then I'll introduce the panel of speakers. And at the end, we'll have questions and answers. Please put your questions in the chat box and we will do our best to get to as many as we can. Thank you. So first off, let's talk about what to expect from the series. Um, we launched the series because we talk a lot about evidence-based design relative to high performance schools. And we're often referring to children's health studies and academic performance studies. We wanted to take that a step further and talk about the empirical approach behind how buildings work. So our objectives for the series are to inc increase your understanding about essential building science and get you thinking about how you are also a school building scientist. And hopefully that additional understanding will help lead to good decision-making and good outcomes in school buildings. And of course, as always, we wanna be a resource for you. We take an expansive approach to school building of science. I'll talk about that in a bit when we talk about definitions. And we're gonna have expert presenters do a lot of highlights and providing their insights from their careers. And there'll be plenty of opportunity for questions and engagement. Please feel free to email us before or after with any questions you have. And then we hope to have follow-up webinars that will be more in depth that would allow for continuing education credit. Unfortunately, these webinars being only 45 minutes long don't qualify for AIA credit. All sessions will be recorded and available on demand on the Science Building Fridays webpage. So what is building science? It's a multidisciplinary field involving several sciences, physical sciences, physics, chemistry, material science. It also involves life sciences and engineering and architecture to understand how buildings function as a system and with the goal of making them durable, energy efficient, comfortable and safe and healthy for occupants. Traditional building science cover the movement of air, water, and heat in buildings. And so a lot of people think of it as about the building envelope, which it definitely is. Uh, it's also about the materials used inside the building. And if you're familiar with the National Institute of Building Sciences, their scope includes fire protection and seismic design as well. So the image I give you here is partly for fun. This is a psychrometric chart and it uh, illustrates the relationship between air, moisture and heat. Looks a lot more intimidating than it is, but it's actually extremely useful building science tool for understanding that things don't happen randomly necessarily in buildings, that there's, they are understandable and that that understanding can be used to innovate solutions. If anybody's interested in learning more about building science, I'm listing these resources for you. I won't go through them because they will be available on the slide after. There's lots of good information out there. So what do we mean by school building science? 
and why is it different? So the simple answer is, of course, that schools are intended for uh, the use by children for the purpose of learning, which makes them different from office buildings and so on. We know that children are not little adults, not physiologically, not socially and emotionally. We coined the term school building science to capture what's special about school buildings and how they work for children. We give you two working definitions. Our detailed comprehensive definition is first, the body of knowledge that informs the design, construction, operations, and occupancy of school buildings for the benefit of students, educators, staff, and the environment. And if you want something more elegant and child-focused, we have the body of knowledge about the built environment that relates to how children learn and thrive. So you can see under these definitions how anybody involved in making school buildings high performance is effectively a school building scientist. Topics in school building science, uh, some of them we will be covering this year in the webinar series. I've put those in blue. Uh, generally, I would say that school building science incorporates all of the traditional building science topics, plus several others, light quality, social emotional comfort, security, water conservation and quality, the outdoor environment even, um, children's environmental health, resiliency, healthy materials, and passing the knowledge along to students, and many more, of course. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to today's experts. First, we have Juan Guarín from Perkins Eastman. Juan is a sustainability specialist on the Perkins Eastman firm-wide sustainability team. Juan combines his bachelor's in architecture and his master's in environmental building design with his passion for sustainability, building science, indoor environmental quality, inclusive design and community engagement to develop a high level of expertise around building performance and pre and post occupancy evaluations. Mark Midorski is a, a professional engineer and president of LEAF Engineers. He has served as president there since the inception in 2002 and is a recognized national expert on MEP engineering, sustainable design practices, net zero solar project development and next generation learning environments. Mark also happens to be one of the founders of the Texas CHIPS criteria. He oversees all of LEAF's engineering option, operations and um, he has a thorough and thoughtful approach to high performance schools. And last but not least is our very own Alex Buchanan. Alex studied civil engineering as an undergraduate and has a master's of architecture from the University of Colorado at Denver. Prior to joining CHIPS as a project reviewer, she served as a commissioning engineer on a portfolio that includes K-12 schools and worked in construction management. Alex is a certified building enclosure professional and a certified commissioning authority. And with that, I'm gonna ask them all to think about one question in particular. What does building science mean to you and how does it relate to the design of healthy, sustainable schools? Juan. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, first of all, it's an extremely difficult question, but if I had to define what building science means to me, uh, I would say that building science is pretty much just making smart design decisions informed by data in order to generate high performing uh, buildings and in order to enhance the experience of the occupants inside those buildings. So uh, I think that this graph that we're seeing in the screen defines building science uh, perfectly in my opinion, because it shows how we as designers can have a big impact during the early stages of the project, uh, but without having any significant overcost to the project. I feel there's a misconception out there in the industry that high performance and uh, sustainable design represents added money and over costs to the project. And that's not necessarily true. And what this graph shows is that the biggest impact that you can have in the overall performance of the building happens during the early stages of design. And these changes and the decisions are usually done for free. Things like the orientation of the building, the window to wall ratio of the building, the right sizing of the program are things that we can develop during the early stages of the project without having to spend an additional penny and that are gonna have huge impact in the overall performance of the building. And then once we have figured out the proper design and one, we, we've applied this smart design decisions, then it's a matter of incorporating smart systems. But at this point, since we've already done a very efficient building, uh, the, the systems that we're gonna apply to our building are going to be significantly smaller and significantly more efficient. If you go to the next one. 
but it's not only about the building. Uh, for us, uh, building science and high-performing buildings incorporates uh, sustainability at a holistic level. And that's making sure that the occupant inside the building feels as comfortable as possible. And that what that means is that we take a look at things like daylight, like thermal comfort, like acoustics, and air quality during the design process and during the construction and post-occupancy process to make sure that the occupants are feeling as comfortable as possible inside the spaces. You go to the next one. So that's why every time we design a high performing project here in Perkins Easement, we ask a series of questions during the design process. And every single one of those questions are gonna help us to have a high performing building. And fortunately, we have the, the fortune of having a series of tools in-house that are gonna help us answer these questions. Each one of those tools are used specifically on each one of the stages. And we have tools such as energy modeling tools, daylight modeling tools, uh, envelope performance assessment tools, and sensors that help us determine if our building is designed and it's performed at a high level. If you go to the next one. And talking about timeline, uh, it's important, it's extremely important for us that the timeline is driven by the targets that we set up for the project. Uh, traditionally, you see that the workflow of a project, the mechanical engineer is designing the HVAC systems, the architect is generating the architectural drawings, the commissioning agent just shows up at the end and performs tests on the equipment and the envelope, and there's very few interaction between each other. So our preferred model and our ideal model is a model in which the targets are set up during the early stages and all of the involved parties, all of the stakeholders contribute to the, towards these targets. It's a very beautiful process because you see uh, agents such as the mechanical engineer contributing to things that are not necessarily part of the mechanical engineer scope, such as daylight modeling. And then you see the architects, on the other hand, contributing to things that are not necessarily related to the architect scope, such as the energy model or like the equipment selection. So it's a beautiful process in which all the parties act together as a whole in, lieu, uh, in, in towards the development of this common targets of the project. If you go to the next one, and now I'm going to explain a little bit how this timeline works every time we design a high performing project in Perkins Eastman. Um, we start by, first of all, understanding the climate. Uh, if you go to the next one, Elizabeth, uh, at this point, we don't have any massing, we don't have any geometry, we haven't drawn a single line. The most important thing here is understanding our local climate, understanding how our sun, how the sun is gonna impact our side, understanding how the winds are gonna impact our side, understanding that our side is gonna have different climates throughout the year. The the winds that are gonna be coming to our side in the winter, we're gonna we wanna have them rejected. And the winds that are coming in the summer, we want them accepted. So it's really important for us to understand the weather conditions and the local climatic climatological conditions of our project. If you go to the next one, Elizabeth, and once we understand the climate conditions, we, then we start applying a process of applying passive design strategies. We want to make our building as efficient as possible without it before having to introduce uh, mechanical systems. So that means getting free energy from the sun and getting applying passive design strategies that can reduce the energy consumption of our building. And it's really important for us, again, data-driven design to understand how each one of this passive design strategies are going to contribute towards the overall thermal comfort levels because probably evaporative cooling it's going to be a really efficient strategy in phoenix arizona but it's probably not going to be a very efficient strategy in miami florida so it's important for us to understand the impact of each one of the strategies in the overall performance of our building if you go to the next one please and once we have figured out the local climate conditions one we once we understand the weather then it's a matter for us to start shaping our building, to start designing the massing and to start designing our geometry. If you go to the next one, please. And it starts us with something as simple to understanding what's the ideal orientation of our project. Uh, this is a beautiful example. It's a high school here in Washington, DC that is pursuing net zero energy. Originally, the client wanted to orient the building along 
a north-south axis with the core learning spaces facing east and west. We all know that rule of thumb is that ideal orientation of a building should be along an east-west axis with spaces facing north and south. But through energy modeling and through uh, performance analysis, we were able to generate a series of analysis and, and extract the data. And we were able to prove that the uh, building oriented along an east-west axis was not only performing 8% better from an energy perspective, but had 4% more daylight and 6% less glare. So again, holistically understanding not only the performance of the building, but how this is going to affect the experience of the occupant inside the building. And obviously, an 8% energy reduction for a building that's pursuing net zero is massive, is significant. Uh, if you go to the next one, and it also under and it also starts by understanding that our building is going to be surrounded by a context, but that we're going to have to do we're going to have neighbors that we're going to have to respect. We want to make sure that our building doesn't affect negatively our neighbors. And something that we do is understand the impact of our geometries of the designs that we do uh, towards the context where the project is situated. Uh, and this happens by doing a series of shadows analysis to understand how the building is going to perform during the summer, during the fall, during the spring, and during the winter, and try to have as least impact as possible over our surrounding context. You go to the next one. And it, it's also a matter of understanding that not only the inside of the building is going to be used, but also the outside of the building is going to play a significant role, especially in a school. Uh, These outer spaces are going to be used by kids, uh, and they're going to be used very frequently by kids. So a very important process for us is to provide outdoor spaces that are as comfortable as possible, making sure that they're suitable for the use in the summer and they're suitable for the use in the winter. And we try to understand how the microclimate maps and the microclimate weathers work on each one of these courtyards and outdoor spaces, trying to provide the most comfortable outdoor space possible. If you go to the next one. And also, it's extremely important for us to control the amount of glass that we use in our projects. Um, one of our mechanical engineers says that uh, a piece of glass is just a poorly insulated wall. And it's true, uh, the, our windows are going to be our weak points in our envelopes. So uh, this is the point where we're going to have all of our heat, uh, heat gains and all, all of our heat losses. So. Where do, does it make sense to put the windows throughout the building? Where does it make sense to put the, the glazing throughout the envelope? Uh, without having a very dark building, but making sure that we don't get those excessive heat gains and heat losses that we really want to avoid. If you go to the next one, and again, as I was saying, we don't want to have a very dark space. So given the fact that we have this very limited uh, window to wall ratio for our high performing projects, we want to make sure that we're putting the glass in the right location. And we're making sure that we're applying as many strategies as possible to increase daylight, to reduce glare without necessarily having a glass box, without necessarily having a building that is 70%, 80% window to wall ratio. And this is a great example of how you can increase daylight levels in a building without necessarily increasing the amount of glass you have in the project. If you go to the next one, but OK, at this point, we already figure our massing. We already figure our building. We already figured our geometry. The next step is making sure that we're detailing and we're selecting the right materials. And we're making sure that the project is as high performing as possible from every single detail inside and outside the building. So if you go to the next one, it starts by understanding what materials we're going to be putting in our envelope and how those materials are going to impact the thermal performance of the occupants inside the building. And we use a series of tools such as like the one you're seeing here, like therm on the upper part to understand what wall assemblies are going to give us the least amount of thermal bridging and woofy like the one you're seeing on the bottom part of your screen to understand that the wall assembly is not going to be accumulating water content or moisture over time. If you go to the next one, and again, it's not only about the energy performance of the building. Uh, we, we try to address sustainability and performance in a holistic way. So another thing that we do is that we like running embodied carbon analysis, life cycle assessments, and try to test multiple systems against each other to see which one is not only performing from a thermal bridging and a moisture content perspective, but also which one has the highest amount of embodied carbon. And what we do is that we determine through a tool called Tally, the one you're seeing on the screen right now, which 
wall assembly has the higher body, the highest embodied carbon. And we try to use this to generate and to add more data to the decision we're making of the ideal wall assembly. If you go to the next one, but again, all of this analysis, all of this performance simulations are completely useless if we don't make sure that all of these parameters, all of this data are introduced into the specifications. And if we don't make sure that this is tested on site to make sure that we found in the computer is actually being applied on site. It's extremely important for us to determine the targets that we want for the project. It's extremely important for us that these targets get included in the specifications. And it's extremely important that then we have on site testing, making sure that the construction is meeting those performance targets that we set up at the early stages of the project. If you jump into the next one, but again, we need to make ourselves accountable and we need to understand if our project is actually performing. So if you go into the next one, uh, we have a very robust post-occupancy post studies and we have a series of tools and sensors that help us determine if the targets that we set up during the early stages of the project are actually being met during post-occupancy. And by that, we analyze the air quality levels of the spaces, daylight levels of the spaces, acoustics. And we even go into the detail to taking thermal imaging pictures of the building and compare them versus the old building and understand where the thermal bridging is and if we and if our envelope is performing at a high level. And I know Alex is going to talk later on about how commissioning is extremely important for a high performing building. So I don't go I won't go into the details of that. But if you go to the next one, part of what we do in our post occupancy studies is understand how the user is feeling in the building. And what we do is that we provide surveys to understand how people feel with the design we have provided them. And it's very gratifying for us to know this is a great example of the Martin Luther King School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. What we found is that 100% of the occupants are proud to work in the building. 97% of the occupants uh, are better, think that this is the better place to spend their day. 90% agree that the design of the school supports education. And most importantly, 100% of the people agree that the school is a pleasing place to work and learn. So I want to close with this. It's obviously about having a high performing building, obviously about making sure that we have as high efficiency as possible with energy. But at the end of the day, if you go to the next one, Elizabeth, it's about the people who are gonna be using the building. It's about enhancing the experience of the user, enhancing the experience of the kids that are gonna be using the schools, creating a high performance learning environment and providing the kids and the teachers and the staff with a healthy, environment that is going to serve as a teaching tool for them to learn about things like renewable energies, energy efficiency, and climate change. So that for me is pretty much the definition of building science and high performance design. Thank you so much, Juan. And next we're going to hear from Mark on the engineer's perspective on building science and how that relates to healthy, sustainable schools. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry. For a consulting engineer, such as uh, the team we have here at LEAF, it's about solving a problem. Um, architects and owners will huddle up. They'll, they'll come up with a building concept. Sometimes we're involved in the early going. Oftentimes, we're not. And we'll get a set of schematics. And we know right off the bat, from an energy performance standpoint, um, we've got an energy code to deal with, but um, here at CHIPS, it's not about just meeting the minimum. So we immediately said about how can we come up with some measures to beat, to beat this energy code. Um, the first stage is always something that I'll call passive measures. We'll look at massing, we'll look at orientation, uh, we'll talk about obvious shading opportunities, uh, but then we'll kick it up a notch we'll start looking at equipment that's capable of daylight harvesting and what that might mean and is that appropriate. Uh, equipment that's capable of energy recovery and, and what that might mean and if, if that's appropriate. And then we just keep building on stacks. You know, the next step for us is controls optimization. Can we come up with an automation system, optimize start, demand control ventilation? Uh, the goal is always lowering our, our consumption and then if we still can't get to the owner's goal, uh, we start talking about renewable energy, either 
renewable energy credits offsite or onsite renewable energy. And we do have some really bold clients, some mavericks out there who say, I want to get to net zero and beyond. And uh, we're part of a, a group that's embraced the AIA 2030 challenge. So we'll be talking about how do we come up with a system where we actually generate more energy than we consume. So that's the, that's the progression from uh, left to right. Go ahead, Elizabeth. So at the beginning, we're always talking about what is the energy use intensity? Um, that graph there shows you various climate zones. The, the blue is cooling and the reddish color is heating. And so depending on what we have to face uh, in our particular zone, we, we have a national practice. So sometimes we're in, we're in Northern Michigan or Northern California. A lot of times we're along the Gulf Coast and our, our decisions for building systems will be informed by, do we have a really high hurdle to clear to heat the building or a really high hurdle to clear to cool the building? Or are we in that sweet spot where, hey, we've got kind of a, an equivalent intensity and in energy required on the heating and the cooling side? So those are some of the factors that we consider when we're trying to decide what is our energy use intensity going to be and making a realistic selection at the beginning is important uh, to informing the rest of the decisions from that point forward. So I mentioned renewable energy. I wanted to show just a little snippet of a real life project. Uh, this particular project is a one megawatt solar array. It's owned and operated by a school client. And it, it was, it started with a vision. Um, this particular owner was concerned with uh, the consumption of fossil fuels, the stability of the, you know, the utility grid in the area, and especially in the, in the K-12 market where we operate, the maintenance and operations cost to, to fund operations on a building this size. It was a 250,000 square foot junior high, projected energy costs around 160,000 bucks a year. And so as we got into the project, um, we were asked, hey, how much could we potentially save? And we didn't want to overpromise and underdeliver, but suffice it to say, we are, uh, this, this one megawatt array is netting around 20, net 20, which means 80% of what is uh, needed to power the building is produced on site. And equally as important, the energy bills after the first year and uh, school districts often will repeat a design. They have a sister building that's running right around $160,000 per year to operate. And this uh, first year of full operation came in at 32,000, which is right at 20% uh, of, its, of its sister. So it was about, for this particular client, financial responsibility. So we were able to prove you can do a financially uh, responsible design with on-site renewables. As our sustainability expert mentioned, uh, the site building layout has a lot of impact on what we do. Um, here at LEAF, what we'll do is when the architect uh, sets us loose, we'll start running building loads. And we have a set of parameters that we use. When we see the CFM, the cubic feet per minute of air sneaking up above some uh, benchmarks we've established, we'll drill down a little deeper and say, what's going on with that space? And, and normally we'll notice, okay, it is a glazing issue or possibly it's a, a, a roofing issue. So we'll use that information. We'll use our load process, the science of, of running HVAC loads to give some feedback to our design team to let them know, hey, we've got a few spaces that are out of bounds. So what can we do uh, to lower um, the energy usage intensity on a space-by-space -space basis. Um, I mentioned the envelope. This is an aerial shot of a, a real live high school in Texas. Yes, we build them bigger here. This is a 650,000 square foot um, high school and it's got a massive roof load. And so the discussions about the material, the roof width, the performance of the roof, it, it obviously dominated uh, many, many discussions, and there's always a, a price point to be had for performance on any uh, building envelope element. 
but we were able to use the iterations on our energy model to show them, okay, for every uh, tenth uh, of a U value improvement we can get, here's the, here's the savings and operating cost. And of course, the, the science informs our decisions on HVAC system selection. Certainly the climate zone has a huge impact on, on these decisions, but a lot of times, again, it's the maintenance and operations departments of uh, public school systems and have to weigh in on what can they take care of. We've not done them a good uh, service if we give them a, a system that they're not familiar with, that they have constant maintenance issues with. And so what you're looking at here is kind of a graduated scale. We've benchmarked some of the more popular systems. Um, all of these meet the energy code. So what we're talking about is which, which ones blow the energy code out of the water more and more and more. And as you move up the, up the scale, you'll see that happening. But again, ground source heat pumps aren't for everyone. Uh, being able to drill the wells effectively and have access to well drillers, it sometimes precludes uh, putting in a geothermal system. Um, but again, I just wanted to show the team on this call, whatever the system is, uh, we can maximize it. We can, we'll certainly can exceed the energy code, and then we can use it to help us meet our energy conservation goals. Outdoor air is something that really we could take another 10 minute segment to talk about. And if we're talking about educational outcomes, we know there's a, just an absolute linear direct impact um, on the indoor environmental quality, especially the CO2 levels. Um, so, and, and in this COVID era, we've uh, had to expand our services to give owners some guidance on, on COVID preparedness and COVID readiness. The bottom line is making sure ventilation rates are strong, certainly at code, but in some cases exceeding uh, code minimum mandates. And so for those owners who've, who've taken the step to say, you know what, I want I don't want to err on the short side of outside air. I want to err on the high side. Uh, energy recovery becomes something that we talk about. You're seeing an energy recovery wheel in this particular picture. Um, what you're able to capture with this type of machinery is 70 to 80% of the BTUs that you've already used to either cool or heat the air before you discharge it uh, out of the building. You're able to reclaim that energy and that energy recovery goes a long way to reducing um, your investment costs for this type of technology. I mentioned um, indoor environmental quality. This is, a, this is an instrumentation uh, change in our, in our school world. Now we're at, teachers are asking a lot more questions than they used to. What, you know, how much fresh air am I getting? How much, what is the CO2 level in my room? What's the relative humidity in my room? Um, what's the relative air movement? And so there's more and more information that we're putting in these sensors, really with the ultimate goal of being able to see in real time, how is the educational space performing? Um, the indoor air quality has got to be spot on. Districts have really stringent guidelines for these performance metrics. And so we're seeing that this instrumentation is starting to inform so much more of operations. It really comes down to the classroom teacher and making sure that environment is as good as it can be. This is just a pie chart of the various pieces that we analyze. And the reason we like to see it as a pie chart, you can see which ones are bigger slices. So when we're running iterations, we tend to attack those that are just a little bit bigger pieces of the puzzle. Um, and depending on our climate zone, space heating might be the biggest or space cooling might be the biggest, but always but we have to deal with equipment loads and um, air loads. But we can start to see as we tweak systems, as we try different glazing, or as we try different roofing, what happens to our overall energy use intensity. So the goal here is to find that sweet spot of performance, and cost. And I, I just throw the piggy bank slide in there because owners are always asking, well, why did you give me something that costs so much I couldn't afford it? Um, or why did you 
spend extra for something that really didn't do much to um, reduce my kilowatt hour consumption or demand. So we're always looking for that best value. And I'm, many owners will say, you know what, let me make that decision. So we'll take some of these features as alternates. Um, we'll, we'll discuss them up front and know that it might impact the bid price somewhat. But because of the performance and the payback, it really does represent the best life cycle value to the district. Because again, they're fighting this MO cost. We've got capital funds to build a building, but we can't use those funds to operate it. We've got a separate uh, MO tax rate. And so we're always looking at uh, these features from a full life cycle cost analysis to see which provides the best life cycle cost overall. This is a digital simulation tool that we call the digital twin. We're starting to get buildings that have a lot going on and it's ultimately um, can be a headache for a client who needs to run a building that has so many systems and so many whiz bang gadgets. And what we've come up with is a, a controls algorithm. It gives a, a display of the building in real time so you can see very quickly and simply by a, a change in color hey, what zone is having some trouble? And when you drill down on it, what kind of problems are going on so that any type of maintenance that needs to happen, folks show up with a, a solution already in, in mind because they've been able to get a ton of detail from this, this virtual digital twin that pulls up submittals and all kinds of data on the individual air systems that might be um, having any kind of difficulty in the building, but it's key to be able to maintain the performance of the building and you need good data to do that and you need it at your fingertips. Many of our clients run 30, 40, 50, 60, 150 buildings. Uh, they can't be running around without good information. And so this is my last slide. It's kind of a, a wrap up of something that is a little bit um, of a new science. And it's uh, the makers of Autodesk have a program that they actually um, have that term triple bottom line. So I'll footnote them on that. But it's the intersection of people, planet and profit. And uh, one real life example was the was the solar array that I showed you earlier. Um, if you run that through this triple bottom line analysis, uh, the the use of an on site array actually reduced the adverse effect uh, of air pollution from uh, a regional uh, energy producers to the tune of about two and a half million dollars in uh, the avoidance of, of lost productivity and the carbon emissions as well uh, because you were not uh, because you were producing your own kilowatt hours on site uh, that translated to around 1.7 million dollars over the lifespan of that particular feature and lastly the pure profit was this solar array itself generated 3.7 million dollars in true net income to the owner. So instead of just a $3.7 million decision, it wound up being an $8 million decision of that. Um, that decision in terms of raw financial incentive was much larger than just looking at the profit. So we're taking a holistic view and for consulting engineers, that's what uh, energy modeling and, and building science is all about. Thank you, Mark. And now we'll turn it over to Alex, uh, our Certified Commissioning Authority. Alex, tell us about Building Science for You and how it relates to healthy, sustainable schools. Sure. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, before I get into answering those questions, I just wanted to touch on what commissioning is for those who might not be familiar. So commissioning is a quality-oriented process that can be used throughout uh, the delivery of a project to help ensure that a facility and all of its systems and assemblies meet the owner's defined criteria. And this defined criteria is often laid out in a document we call the OPR, which stands for Owner's Project Requirements. So you'll be hearing me refer to that document. Um, commissioning can be applied to different building systems. And for example, the CHIPS criteria covers mechanical lighting, plumbing, irrigation, and building enclosure systems commissioning. And this last topic of building and closure commissioning is what I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, so for an enclosure to perform well, it needs to control the movement of air, heat, and water. And this is done through the 
the assembly's control layers. Building and closure commissioning is used to verify that these control layers, including the water, air, vapor, and thermal layers, as shown in this uh, graphic, are, are meeting the OPR. Um, next slide, please. So to me, building science is a really integral part of building and closure commissioning. And I'll narrow my focus from what Juan and Mark covered to just three fundamental principles that we use to guide our process and problem solving as we're looking at these control layers of the building. So the first is just movement of moisture, which moves from warm to cold and from more to less. Um, the movement of air, which moves from higher pressure to lower pressure and the movement of heat, which moves from warm to cold as shown in this heat flow diagram. So during the design phase of a project, some of the ways we use this principle is in evaluating the order of the water, air, vapor, and thermal control layers of the enclosure assemblies. We need to consider where the dew point falls within the assembly and how to mitigate condensation potential in the given climate, as Juan was talking about earlier. We also need to look at the continuity of these control layers and make sure that the transitions are um, continuously detailed between all of the different enclosure assemblies. So looking at the um, continuity of the thermal control layer, making sure we have continuous insulation, looking at how we're controlling water movement at window and door openings, uh, making sure the air barrier of the roof ties into the air barrier of the wall. And this graphic from the AIA is showing how we might look at a wall to parapet to roof transition and trace the continuity of these control layers through these assemblies. And I'll note here too that um, the enclosure systems I'm talking about don't have to be limited to interior to exterior conditions. We should apply these principles to any spaces that are environmentally distinct. So this might include interior to interior conditions in some instances. Um, one common example of an interior to interior condition we'd wanna look at is um, the enclosure of an auditorium or an indoor pool, which has really high relative humidity and temperature compared to adjacent spaces. So in all cases, but especially in this case, we need to consider how all of the buildings building systems, including the HVAC and enclosure assemblies are gonna to work together to serve that space. During construction, we're also going to use our building science knowledge as we conduct field observations and testing. So when it comes to field observations, we're of course just looking for installations that don't match the design documents and places where the control layers have not been made continuous. But there are also a multitude of other issues, of course, that come up during construction due to availability of materials or coordination issues, quality of work, all of those things. So we always want to use our understanding of building science in the OPR as we're offering recommendations and problem solving with the design team. We can also use testing to verify the OPR is being achieved as Juan touched on earlier. There are a whole host of tests that can be performed on a building and the commissioning agent can help make recommendations based on the building type and the owner's risk tolerance. And I'll note a few examples here where we can test for breaches in the primary control layers we've been, been discussing. So one common test shown in this first image is um, a test of the water control layer and it uses a spray rack to spray water at a specified rate and pressure against a portion of a curtain wall or storefront system to find points where water is moving through the assembly in a way that wasn't intended. So finding and addressing these problem spots can prevent water related issues later and can prevent costly repairs and replacement costs. A blower door test combined with thermal imaging or other diagnostic tool is a common way to test for air leakage. Um, and from our building science principles in the psychometric chart Elizabeth mentioned earlier, we know that air carries water. So if I, by finding breaches in the air barrier system, we can prevent moisture related issues. And by keeping our conditioned air in the building where we want it, we can save energy. We can also look for thermal bridges and discontinuities in our thermal control layer using IR thermo thermography 
And by finding and addressing these issues, we can prevent heat loss and heat, heat gain and help save energy and de decrease operating costs. And so all of what I've mentioned really goes hand in hand with the design of sustainable and healthy schools. Um, by using building science and building and closure commissioning, you can achieve a project that uses resources more efficiently. We can be thinking about material selection and placement through the lens of building science and make choices that align with the OPR in terms of performance, durability, and longevity of the school. By having eyes in the field and verifying performance with testing, we can address problems early and prevent issues and replacement costs down the road and verify that the OPR is being achieved. And through all of these methods, of course, we can improve energy efficiency and decrease operating costs throughout the life cycle of the school. Thank you very much, Alex and Mark and Juan. Um, we are technically out of time, but I do wanna take a few minutes if people can still stay on to um, answer any questions. We do have one question that was put into the box. Um, it is, is net zero achievable with the current building science technology? And I'm wondering if Mark wants to tackle that one first. Uh, the short answer is, of, of course, yes, net zero is. Um, it's getting actually easier and easier to achieve as the, I'm going to say, the, the baseline materials we're using and passive measures improve. Uh, the energy performance of the systems are improving every year. And so the lower we can make our energy use intensity, um, if we can't get quite to zero, we always can generate uh, either on site or through renewable energy credits achieve net zero. I mean, all, all building systems are going to consume power. That's that's a given. We haven't figured out how to change the, the laws of thermodynamics, but we have tools that make it very straightforward to, to achieve net zero. And the actually the return on investment for that um, continues to improve as well. When I was a, a younger engineer, it might have taken 25 years to pay back a solar array. Uh, the most recent ones that we've done are under 10 years now, so it keeps improving. I think the the climate that we're in, and there was no pun intended, um, in, in our world right now is going to put more pressure on designers to continue to find solutions that approach net zero. So I absolutely do think it's possible and we've seen it happen. Does anyone else want to comment on the net zero question? I can add something to that. Um, I would say it's not only possible, but in my opinion, it should almost be a mandate at this point. Uh, we're, all, we're all seeing the impacts of the climate crisis we're living in. And if we don't take drastic measures, it's going to be too late. Uh, Unfortunately, some other jurisdictions in the country are starting to like act on that. Um, <clears throat> Washington DC, for example, the city where I live in, uh, is implementing a very drastic code regulation change so that by the year 2025, uh, there's gonna be a net zero mandate on all new construction. So I think it, it's something that we need to start considering not as something optional, but something that it's almost mandatory for our buildings. And something else I wanted to add is that it's not only net zero is not something that can be achieved through building systems. It's a combination of a lot of things. It's a combination of high performance design, high quality construction. And as Mark mentioned during his presentation, operations, the way in which the building is operated is, cre is key to achieve net zero. The way in which the users uh, occupy the building and the way in which the users uh, use the building is key to net zero. Thank you, Juan. Are there any other questions? I don't, I'm not seeing any in the chat box. So if there aren't any questions or comments, we'll go ahead and end since our time is up. I wanna thank everyone very much for attending and I hope that you'll join us for future sessions. Next month's will be on ventilation and the one in November will be on green and safe cleaning. Thank you again and have a great weekend. Oh, mm -hmm. wait, we do, I do, two, two questions came in. Wait, one question, here we go. Um, if people can hang on just a little bit longer. What kind of human well-being targets are you seeing being implemented beyond lighting and air quality? Are you seeing fit well and well being applied? 
Uh, so I'll just I'll I'll give some context to that. So CHIPS has been around a lot longer than Fit Well and Well. We've always prioritized the health and well-being of the occupants and the children in particular. So our package of high performance school criteria already builds in uh, a number of uh, measures of healthy, um, safe schools. And so if you're following CHIPS criteria, you're doing you're doing that good work. Um, how about if the speakers talk about any other targets that they're seeing being implemented? Acoustics, for example, is a good one. Uh, I can think of drinking water quality as another obvious one for schools. Does anyone want to add any? I can't add to that, yes. Yeah, so yeah, go ahead. Uh, usually, we try to make as much push as possible to for our buildings to pursue like the certifications, the well certification lead uh, and, and net zero energy. But usually when the budget doesn't allow us to, to pursue these kind of standards, what we ended up what we end up doing is that we use the, the certification as a framework and as a guideline in order to conduct our design. Uh, so for example, a well has very interesting concepts around acoustics and air quality. And that's something that we try to apply to most of our projects, regardless of the project is pursuing certification or not, we try to apply the standards around STC ratings, around NRCs, around reverberation and around uh, and around background noise levels. Uh, and that's why we try to use the well building standards, sometimes fit well and sometimes chips as a baseline, regardless of our projects are pursuing certification or not, as a framework to design our projects. And we establish like minimum performance targets that we try to include in our specifications from an acoustics perspective, from a daylight perspective, from an air quality perspective. And we try to make sure that what we intended at the beginning of the project during design is being applied during construction and after occupancy. And that's why I kind of mentioned that one of our heavy, uh, one of our heavy involvement in the project is post-occupancy studies and make sure that the data that we're collecting supports our design targets that were established at the beginning of the project. Thank you. Juan, I want, I want to ask a follow-up question to that. Are you finding that uh, hitting acoustics targets is um, doable and well understood by team members? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, in the past, the only reference that we had for acoustics was LEED, and we either had the prerequisite or the credit. Um, the prerequisite, it's obviously something we got to pursue for our projects just as, a, as, a, as an FYI, uh, school projects in Washington, D.C. have to pursue lead gold as a minimum. So we're forced to, to meet the acoustics prerequisite. However, the acoustics credit was usually out of scope because of how expensive it was to pursue the credit and how little return it gave us with just one point. But what we've been starting to do is that we starting to select a series of strategies from both the lead credit and the well credits around acoustics. And we've been noticing that for example, hitting the NRC ratings is quite possible. Uh, hitting some of the STC ratings for divisions between classrooms, it's highly it's very achievable hitting a minimum level of reverberation and background noise is also very achievable and that's why we try to pick and choose some of the strategies and the lead and well standards that we could apply to to the project some others are extremely hard to achieve uh, background noise lead has a series of, of thresholds achieving the highest threshold is almost impossible stc ratings for doors for windows, it's also extremely hard for it to achieve. So that's why we've tried to like pick and choose which strategies make the most amount of sense. At the end of the day, we almost never pursue the credit, the acoustics credit, but we do pursue certain strategies from the credits. Thank you. Yeah, it wasn't so much about achieving the credits as it was about general understanding out there of, how, of what makes for good acoustics and what's doable. Thank you. Okay, anybody else wanna ask a question? And if not, we will end. And thank you again. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? Can hear you, yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, actually, uh, I've been practicing with CHIPS for about uh, more than 15 years in the school's implementation of this uh, program. 
uh, gave us a result in 2009 or 2008, uh, in a comparison of benchmark with lead uh, that is similar to well and health, that CHIPS was stringent and more efficient for schools in terms of uh, all the health and well uh, in, in, uh, in these parameters and implementations were successful with the CHIPS in 2008 in uh, Los Angeles. We got the first uh, gold uh, lead when in, in the market around the nation was not even known uh, the implementation of the schools. So CHIPS has a very, very deep uh, understanding of, of what is providing well, uh, you know, the health and uh, well-being for uh, education specifically for years. And it, it was really already recognized that it was even uh, compared to LEED that was then the best, the best and highest standard of um, this, uh, the gold and platinum, uh, we have a very stringent uh, direction in the, in the criteria. And so I think that is kind of our, our uh, experience with CHIPS uh, in educational buildings, having these as a comparison, I think CHIPS is the stringent um, understandable criteria <laughs> for implementations. Thank you for that, Angela. Sure. Okay. Okay, everybody, thank you so much. We will let you go. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everyone.